the Pledge of Allegiance, followed by a moment of silence. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please join us in a moment of silence. Thank you. Item four, citizen concerns. The first thing on the agenda here today, citizen concerns. Anything that is not on the agenda? Item five, approval of the agenda. I'll move it. Second. Motion by Raddick, second by Taylor. Any discussion? All, right. All those in favor say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Passes. Uh, Justin, you're out there, right? Yeah. Okay. Right. Pass, passes five zero. Moving on to the consent agenda, items six through eleven constitute a consent agenda of routine action items to be considered by one motion. Items pass unanimously unless a separate vote is requested by a board member. Item six is approval of the minutes of the May seventeenth, twenty twenty two meeting. Item seven, approval of claims. Item eight from the county treasurer A is approved property tax refund request for GJ. For parcel 88470611 in the amount of $290. And B is approve property tax re, uh, refund request for FIG Capital Investments for parcel 88433245214 in the amount of $567. Item 9 from Human Resources A is approval memorandum of personnel transactions and B is authorization to initiate hiring process. 10A is approval of resolution adopting and levying special assessment in the Little Sioux Intercounty Drainage District of Monona, Woodbury, and Harrison Counties, Iowa. 10B is approval of resolution adopting and levying special assessment in the McCandles Intercounty Drainage District of Monona and Woodbury Counties. And C is approval of resolution adopting and levying special assessment in the Sand Hill Lake Board Intercounty Drainage District of Monona, Woodbury Counties. Item 11 from Secondary Roads is approved permit to work in the right of way for 2167 340th Street. Uh, Whiting to direct the chair to sign the permit. So that ends the consent agenda. Any, anything to be discussed on there? Move approval. Second. Motion by DeWitt. Second by Taylor. Any discussion on the motion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? And passes 5 to 0. That ends the, uh, let's see, item 12, citizen. Diane Drevis and Chris Country, Woodbury County Financial Support for Construction of Regional Medical Clinic in Woodbury County. Hello, my name is Chris Countryman. I live in rural Woodbury County, uh, just north of Mobile. I have with me today a couple other citizens. Diane Dreves is here. She's uh, also a rural Mobile, Iowa person living south of Mobile. Mobile, Iowa's location at the intersection of Highway, Highway, one, Highway 20 and Highway 140 in the Mobile Blacktop provides an ideal location for easy access to medical clinic for the rural Woodbury County. Currently, Mobile has a clinic located on Main Street. However, the clinic is too small for the services that need to be provided. There are only three exam rooms. The hallways are too small for wheelchairs. Their uh, emergency carts and handicap accessibility is limited. There is a limited parking on the, uh, at the current facility and the inclined access to the entrance is challenging for many of the elderly. In communities surrounding Moville, the lab and radiology equipment are outdated. Since <coughs> Moville's clinic currently has the most updated equipment in the surrounding clinics, many patients are sent there to the, sm the smaller clinic and, uh, for additional testing. And however, the equipment at Moville will soon also be outdated as the technology advances. Additionally, the current physical therapy rehab department in the clinic is bulging at its seams and sees patients from not only Woodbury, but also Ida, Plymouth, Cherokee, and Monona counties, and they are desperate for expansion as well. The community of Mobile has a plan to improve the current issues with our medical services. We believe that the construction of a new regional medical clinic is necessary to take care of our rural medical needs. And we are here today to explain the situation to you and ask the Board of Supervisors for financial and collaborative support 
to help improve the lives of your rural constituents and many others in the Siouxland areas. It's been determined that the poor health outcomes for rural Iowa has been linked to a growing older population with poor access to health care. About 20% of Americans live in rural areas, but barely one-tenth of all physicians actually practice there. And the federal government projects that a shortage of over 20,000 primary care physicians in rural areas by 2025. Primary care physicians often do not have the support of specialists, hospitalists, energy, uh, and emergency physicians, and our plan links with a large regional medical center that will solve many of these problems in Woodbury County. Rural patients must often travel farther for their care and are reluctant to take time off from work and travel long distance in inclement weather, and as a result, rural patients often delay seeking care, which can lead to more complex illness and a sicker patient. Our plan to build a new modern facility in a rural area addresses the issue of accessibility. Although the needs of caring for rural populations can be daunting, many physicians find the rewards for caring rural communities as a meaningful professional calling, yet they must have tools to work with, updated equipment, ad adequate workspace, telehealth access, and mobile health applications are needed to connect patients with their health care providers. Our plan will ensure that rural Woodbury County will have access to modern medical technology. Access to health care is necessary to attract and retain business in rural areas as well. Employers want to be located in communities that offer urgent care and other medical services to their employees and families. Our plan will provide these much needed medical services to help attract more business and jobs to the area. The nonprofit Mobile Area Medical Clinic Board is committed to this effort and we are excited to continue to support this uh, important work, but we need your help. The Woodbury County Board of Supervisors can play a key role in supporting this project and help us achieve our critical goal. Thank you. Is what uh, financially is the ask as far as? We currently have been in the process of raising um, funds for this project. We, it's a, a, approximately a $5 million project and Diane has the numbers here. We are approximately $2 million. Over, just a little over $2 million is what we've raised. That we've raised so far. $700,000 of that came from the Missouri story. Bird. 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 So with, uh, with the funds that have already raised and with financing that we have procured through local banks and also rural development groups, uh, we feel that we're approximately a million dollars short of our goal at this point. And as far as using ARPA funds, would this be something that would be? Um, I don't know much about the project, but in general, ARPA can go to healthcare purposes within its parameters. Um, so I would say it's a possibility. So we do have some pictures for you to take a look at if you want to uh, understand the concept. It's a two-story facility with the upper level being for the physical therapy and also a wellness center. And then the main level is on the, is on the first, first story. Both of them are street level access. You'll actually drive up around the building and be able to have street level access. So it's more accessible for everything as well. If you want to take a look at these pictures or not. Mr. Chair. Go ahead. Do you have an approximate number of how many employees would be at this facility and how many hours a day would it operate? I would say, I'm dying for you. Can you come up here for us, please? Yes. Sorry for mispronouncing your name there. Everybody does. I did when I met him. <laughs> um, approximately 23 employees. Um, we, it still depends on, it depends on the providers. You know, how many nurses they might need. We have a physical therapy department, which has a physical therapist and um, uh, two physical therapists right now and physical therapy assistants. And um, then we would have lab people, radiology people, and so forth. Is there a, is there a hospital affiliation with, with the current? We've been working, we have been working with Mercy. And is there anticipated to be the same going? Going forward. We, we hope to um, part continue to participate with them. They've given us a letter of uh, commitment. And then roughly hours of operation? 
five days a week, okay. eight hours a day. We don't know the urgent care would definitely be open in the daytime. We don't know about the evening and weekend hours. Just looking for basics. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I have some more things. You want to skip? I'll let you hear it. You Thank you. Nice <laughs> <laughs> Looks going to be deceiving. Are there any other questions? This facility is still being owned by the non We would own it, we would lease it to CNOS, who has also given us a letter of intent for the physical therapy and rehab area, and we would um, lease it to a medical center who would um, have the family practice and specialty clinic areas. Okay. And then we also have a wellness area on there that we haven't developed to a great deal because we're working on the other two areas right now. And I guess, you know, as far as, you know, a county's perspective, obviously we can't just always just sure. show up with a million bucks for anything, but uh, we do have some potential to use funds that might be out there that, uh, you know, we, we'd have to work together and figure out if we can help out or not, but, um, you know. That's absolutely what we thought. So. But, you know, this is just such a, a county-wide project mm -hmm. and would um, really enhance the whole county. Mm -hmm. And I so agree, that, with, I agree with that statement. Not just Mobile. Yeah. So that's what we want, really want to stress as well. And then with the other collaboration part of it, there is there's so much involved with, with this, with uh, the frontage road uh, will be improved upon in, in that particular area. There's a lot of development, new businesses going on along the frontage road at this point in time. one of the largest projects that our community has ever taken on. So guidance and collaboration is another thing that we're, we're looking for for all of those things that I'm sure you're aware of that we are not aware of that we can help bring to our attention. There's also a possibility in the, in the medical clinic that the president of there is a nice building at all. There's also a child care, daycare facility in the remote area of this. You're saying in the old facility? The old facility. Okay. Our dream doesn't quit with the medical clinic. Sure. We want to turn the old facility into a daycare. So in, uh, is it the same nonprofit that owns the old facility? Yes. Okay. Go ahead. First off, commend you for all that you're doing in terms of the public-private uh, partnership for applying for MERD grants, for um, making us maybe one of the last uh, asks. That doesn't always happen, so that's commendable on your part. So thank you. We thought of you in the beginning. Yeah, however. I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> we knew you had a lot of work you were doing. One of the things that was alluded to was uh, ARPA funding, and I know we'll have a discussion about that later on in a, in a different venue, but uh, we do have funds, and one of the things that I think would behoove us to explore is beyond COVID mitigation as far as access to health care out in rural areas, if there's an allowance for funding, we're trying to, because our budget is set for this next year, stay away from property taxes to the extent that we can and look at alternative sources. So I'd like to see if we could look into how that might be um, allowable more specifically if we can in the next couple of weeks, if that is a potential. I, I will say too that part of it has a drive-through area when you spoke about COVID. There's a drive-through area on the west side, so if someone comes in, not just COVID, chicken pox, you know, those types of things, we have to test them outside so it doesn't come into the clinic. And we've made different provisions in our design for those types of things, as we, well as teleconferencing. If there's anything uh, that you all think of too that regards COVID mitigation or pandemic-like testing and so on that we could have that would help to arm us. So if you can email, I think, mm -hmm. any, I, any I, one of us, okay. that's something that we can be a conduit of looking at those rules and making sure that they're aligned there, and that might give us greater allowance to be able to potentially participate. I can do that. Thank you. Yeah, I'd like to know what's possible as far as the funding source. ARPA may be something we could explore. Um, I did reach out to our attorney's office and, and did get you some communication back on 
what we can, oh, yeah, April 28th, right here. Mm. May have went to your spam. <laughs> Best have gone there. <laughs> okay. Sorry. Well, it says, hi, Diane. I looked into the possibility of county funding for this project, and although obviously very worthwhile, I believe our hands are tied by some recent rule changes uh, by the Iowa Secretary of State, as linked below. Our county attorney's office guidance of that document is that funding for nonprofits in this way is not an allowable use, again, due to this recent change. Sorry for the bad news. And I sent that to Dennis to forward back on to you, so. But ARPA funds are specifically. Yeah, ARPA is different, so. Yeah. Okay. What was the funding source you were refer referencing? Tax so funds. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. At that point, it was just the general contribution and. <coughs> You know, again, we have some more stipulations on nonprofits due to auditor rules, but ARPA is something where we can find maybe a carve out with rural service or something like that. And it's more lenient towards new funding, okay. um, incremental increases to protect against uh, communicable diseases and things like that. So that'll be probably our best area to explore. Well, um, I will get that information to you then. Okay. And thank you. I did not get that email. That's all right. I figured sending it <laughs> to Dennis would send it back on to you, and but uh, I'll resend it to you. Thanks, Matthew. <laughs> so, Joshua, you have your homework. Yeah, if somebody can pass along whatever information is provided about the COVID mitigation piece of it, that would be helpful. We appreciate your guidance. Thank you. Thank you. All right, item 13 for secondary roads. A, approve FY 2022 Woodbury County Secondary Road Department Budget Amendment Number 1. Good afternoon, Mark Nara, Woodbury County Engineer. <clears throat> we are... Uh, Submitting our budget amendment for DOT, uh, we have a calendar deadline of June 1, so this is the last meeting we have the opportunity to bring it forward. Um, the uh, budget is allowing us to expend some funds that uh, were carryover from last year, and our local option sales tax is in excess of what we expected this year. Uh, this is allowing us to do some purchase of extra gravel and to... Uh, put some extra money into uh, new equipment and diesel fuel, which both went over this year. So uh, those are the adjustments in the budget for last year. We had such a good construction year. We carried over hardly any construction projects. We actually uh, completed the work that we had in the program and had to pay for it prior to the end of the fiscal year, which uh, I don't think's happened in my 14 years here until this year. So uh, we're looking at a much smaller amendment and uh, it's directed toward uh, continued maintenance items. I'll go ahead and move it. Second. Motion by Raddick, second by Taylor. Any discussion or questions on it? All right, all those in favor say aye. 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 Passes 5 0. Thank you, Mark. This is the permit. This is the program. That one says engineer right here. Has the auditor on it too. Thank you. All right, 14A, approved CMBA architectural fee of $7,500 plus reimbursable expenses not to exceed $375 for a total of $7,875. Uh, this agenda item is for uh, the Trosper Hoyt exterior south wall repair um, for the architectural services. Uh, as part of that project, um, this will uh, be part of uh, CMBA's performance would be to draft the plans and specifications to go out for bid on this project. Um, we have some drawings back from our engineers, Raker Roads, uh, uh, that spells out the work that we should be doing to make that repair. Um, so that part of it has been completed. And so our next step, uh, if you were to 
uh, agree with CMBA's uh, uh, quote here and move forward. Our next step would be to uh, get ready to do those plans and specifications for bidding. Uh, the amount we're asking is $7,500 plus $375 in, in reimbursables. Uh, the reimbursables would be used for things like uh, blueprints and items like that. Does this achieve what we need it to achieve in that building then as far as uh, design? Yes. Uh, as you may or may not remember, the south wall has moved out uh, approximately an inch, three quarters to an inch in different places. This would do a repair on the second and third floors. Um, and it would also repair uh, some uh, parapet cap on the roof. Um, and I am told that uh, by the engineers that also this would not impact uh, the files that we want to place on the third floor. Uh, that would eventually, hopefully, come out of the LEC. I move it. Second. Motion by Taylor, second by Raddick. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Passes 5 0. Kenny? I signed one in the pack up already. So uh, 14B, Law Enforcement Center and 28th Street Project Progress Update. Um, yes, uh, so we've got a couple of large projects going on, and we haven't updated the uh, board recently on those projects, and so we felt it was time to do so. Uh, both of those projects going on simultaneously does, uh, does cause a few problems um, and uh, causes us do, to do some, some, some planning that you normally would not if you just had one going on, which makes some items difficult. But I'm just going to give a quick rundown, of, firstly, of the 28th Street project and then a quick rundown of the LEC project. Um, and then I'll ask the groups that I have here with us tonight. I've got... Shane Albrecht with the Baker Group, who's our project manager. Uh, Kevin Rost, uh, who's with Goldberg Group Architects, um, who helped design the project. And also uh, Ron Wick with the Authority, um, who are here to uh, help out with any questions you might have and to provide some additional information. I'll be very brief. Uh, in your backup material, I did give you uh, a generalized uh, list of um, uh, project expenses and, and funding um, to help give the board a little bit of an understanding of um, the projected cost of the facility and where some of those costs uh, are being are being broken out. Um, again, it's very generalized, but uh, 28th Street, a uh, little update on that. Water and sewer lines are complete. Um, a portion of that project uh, caused us to tear up part of a parking lot that the school owns um, where they currently do some food preparation. Um, there's approximately a 20 foot by 50 foot portion of that lot um, that is still opened up and that is going to be hopefully complete next week. Um, the new street has been paved, uh, sealed, erosion control and seating have put, been put in from the trailer park um, almost to the LEC entrance. Um, so a good majority of that street uh, is complete. Um, there are some change orders on that job. Uh, they came mostly at the request of the city of Sioux City. Um, one of those was to upsize some lines and add 20 foot of sanitary sewer line extending to the east for future developments. And so those were addressed as we were going through the project. Um, Outer Belt Drive uh, on 28th Street, as some of you may have already heard, we've reduced down to one lane um, with some traffic signaling. signaling. Um, that's due to uh, an additional uh, turning lane that was required as part of the 28th Street project. Um, that portion is going to take approximately three months. 
so it's going to probably extend into August before that's complete. Um, another downside to that is, but it is required, there are going to be approximately three days when Outer Belt Drive will be completely shut off to traffic. Um, it's something that can't be avoided, it's just part of that construction process. Um, so that will happen, I don't, don't know at what point, I'm assuming toward, probably toward the end of that project. Um, moving on to the uh, LEC. So uh, just one to interrupt, yeah. on 28th Street is the project expected complete at August or just that portion at Outer Drive? Um, it won't be complete. Um, that portion will be, built, will be complete. Most of the project will be complete. There will be one section that won't be complete, and that will be at the LEC entrance. Um, due to the way the project, uh, due to the Maybe. LEC project, I should say, um, the 28th Street project couldn't continue past the LEC entrance because we had to still allow uh, access, into access into the LEC. So, <coughs> yeah. sorry. Uh, getting your backup materials, I did a kind of a budget analysis of the uh, LEC and an overview of some variable allocations as part of that. Also included an AIA uh, certificate of pay payment from Hausman uh, Construction to give you an idea um, of what one of the construction payments look like. Um, uh, it spells out as, as part of some of those documents uh, where basically a portion uh, <laughs> of that money is being applied or, or coming from that the, the contractor is charging us for. Um, to give you a little bit of an understanding of where that's at. It also includes uh, things like change orders that might have been approved. One thing on the budget analysis sheet that I did show you or I did provide to you um, Please keep in mind, the only information on that sheet are uh, things that have been currently approved or they had been approved as of May 19th. Um, the actual AIA document that I provided you uh, didn't get approved until the 24th. So although I included it at your, in, that, in your materials, you don't see that uh, on my budget sheet as a, as a dollar item showing that. If that makes sense. Um, project change orders and, and contingencies, there are several of those. They will be uh, ongoing um, as they do throughout these, both these projects. Um, and so there are line items there that show what, we, what we've approved to date uh, in dollar amounts. And uh, again, those are going to vary and, and those are going to keep coming forward. They're, there are some adds and some deductions on, on depending on what's required of each change order. So, um, at this point, if you have any questions, I think I'll turn it over to Shane if you'd like to come up. And uh, I tried to be brief, but I'll let, I'll let you guys also speak to both of these if you would. When you had a question there, uh, I'll go. Ahead. I'll wait. All right. All right. So, Shane Albrecht, Baker Group, Kevin Ross, Goldberg Group. Um, so one of the things we wanted to do was kind of give you guys an overall update on the project. Um, I also, during the authority meeting, a question was asked to me, and I also wanted to address that during this time, if, uh, if that's okay with you guys. Um, so kind of where the project's at right now, um, we, we've been working on footings and walls and different pieces on the project. Part of the driveway is put in to get concrete access up to the site. We've had... Um, We've had deliveries of all the, everything from bar joists to steel to getting ready for stuff. Right now we're slated for June 13th um, to start setting precast panels. Um, that seems to be, it's kind of been a moving target right now, but um, the last plan that we've been told is they'll be starting in the northeast corner of the, of the jail and, set, and setting around that. Um, the northeast corner is... You're talking the detention area? It, that's where I was headed, is the detention area. And, and they're going to start setting around that whole detention pod, as you would look. They're going to walk around that counterclockwise 
is the direction we've been given. Um, doing some of the interior demising walls as well as all that. So right now they've been working on getting footings and walls up so they can get backfilled in and get started setting those those walls. And once once that starts, it's about a two and a half to three month process to get the last pieces up. But as you start seeing those coming in is, and if you would drive by right now, you would see the big blue, blue a big blue crane out there. There's been cranes for a while, but there's an enormous uh, 250 ton crane out there. That crane will set the precast. Um, the precast is coming from Gage Brothers. It's it's made. It's it's done. It's finished. It's setting at Gage Brothers right now in Sioux Falls. Um, they'll start trucking that down and bringing that down as they're setting it. Uh, uh, we got an update that the steel cells. So the basically the they're like Connex boxes that will be the jail cells. Those have also um, those are also done and ready to ship to our site. Currently on the schedule, that's. Oh, you mentioned that we also made a trip out there to inspect the cells. Yes. And see the actual product that was going to be shipped up here to the county. So we got to see it in the warehouse and the production factory out there. Uh, we got several people from um, Thompson Electric, Seedings, Houseman, uh, some folks from the county, and all going into the fact to see the first hand. So uh, I think a good educational trip for the visitors. So. And we went to Titan Door, and Titan Door is who's making the detention frames and stuff. We got to check that to make sure the conduits were in the right place and the different things and check on the cells so make sure Thompson and CW Suter also were aware of that. Um, so a lot of our material is um, either on the site, at the other site and ready to go. And like I said, people will start seeing as, as they're spinning the, the wreck of the precast, they'll fall behind and start putting up the steel structure that will support the floor so then they can get ready to start pouring what would be the second floor of that. Um, I think, anything else you want to add on that? The only thing I would add to that is a lot of the under slab utilities, all the plumbing, electrical roof, and the foot under slab, they got a majority of that done um, throughout the, what would be the parking area. area. Once they get done with that, we'll be moving up to where the, the precast set after that, and that's where the sheriff's office is just kind of the uh, last piece of that that will be constructed. So. Um, one of the one of the big change orders that we've had on the project right now um, is has been to connect the roads. So basically before when you drove up, um, we weren't required by the fire department until the next phase was built to actually have a road all the way around. But when working with Kenny and working with the sheriff's department and access and stuff, without being able to take a semi all the way around, having to have to make that tight turn and stuff, it was deemed that that made the most sense that we did that we did that road and connected it. So that was, that was right now that is our largest change order uh, to date. Um, we've had, as Kenny pointed out, we've had a number of ads and a number of deducts on the project. Uh, I think um, I think right now I'm probably messing this up. 100 about 125k. Roughly, yeah. In change orders? Right. I think 88 and about 36. I'm sorry, not exact numbers, but. It, it's on Kenny's report in the backup. It was about, yeah, 126, I thought. Yeah. So so that's kind of where that's that's set, okay? Um, during the authority meeting, uh, basically, I, I, I was asked the question of kind of what, and I'll, I'll probably call on Dennis for part of this, kind of if we've defined any projects, I think, for additional money and as well, as what the, what the maximum amount of money that we could spend. I think those were the two questions that were basically asked. Um, is that correct? Um, That's correct. Um, just wanted to make sure. Yep. So right now, um, working with Kenny and the budget analyst, um, I think the maximum dollars we can spend is 60, 69,678,047.19. Um, to make up that number, uh, that is the $25.3 million in taxable bonds. That's the seven, 717,863.12. We may need new glasses, holy buckets. Um, it's 29, it's 29,0060,41435 in tax exempt bonds. It's $14,200,000 in COVID funds. 
375,000 in city contribution. Uh, then there's uh, interest of 20,144.44 and interest exempt of $4,625.28. That's what makes up the 69, 69,678,047.19. Go ahead. Just in conversations with our assistant county attorney, I've wanted to see if there's a, a number that is recognized by the authority not to exceed because we put a $50.3 million ballot issue that was a referendum that was approved by taxpayers. And I wanted to make sure that if we went back to taxpayers that we weren't doing something that was illegal or didn't trigger uh, a bond issue. And so right now the lease agreement says $50.3 million to include furnishings that would be paid by the authority. That's presently still in the lease agreement. Do you know if there's a desire by the authority as I believe is a recommendation to update that lease agreement to reflect this maximum number that can be spent. Um, right now, um, Dennis, yeah. would you come up here and please? There. Okay. There is, there is plans to amend that lease to that number. There's several items there. I got about 28 different changes in that lease that we're gonna have to come back to the Board of Super and Authority to get the numbers correct because this lease was written before the bonds were even sold. So there's several amendments we have to do to get them correct. But yes, this will be moved up to the 69 million, which includes the total project. The bond issue won't change at all. That's 50 million, 300,000. We sold the bonds for that dollar amount. The reason it's bigger, we got a premium on our second bond issue because the interest rates were low enough to get back to where we wanted to. We did get a premium of about 4 million. So we did sell the bonds that were approved by the taxpayer. And all that does, all that does for the taxpayer is show that we did sell the bonds for what they approved. They did not approve the total dollar amount of the project. That is that with all these other features coming in, revenues, expenses. So we've done everything totally legal. There's nothing in my mind that's wrong. And I wanna be clear, there's nothing that I'm suggesting right. um, that is wrong either. I, I, you're relying on other sources other than the $50.3 million that you put on the ballot. Other sources like uh, the Woodbury County donation uh, from the sale of the farm and the city contribution, none of those touch tax. And so I want to be clear, I'm not saying that there's anything untoward otherwise. And about 14200000 14, ARPA money. Right, and that's the genesis of my question. Um, we had $10 million from ARPA funding, which was a standard allowance, which is very easily justifiable. But then this other $4.2 million that's being relied upon right now over the last 11 months, it seems like we've looked at that and asked for what kind of projects are actually going to qualify or not. Because my follow on is if the $4.2 million in these four specific categories do not qualify in conversations that I've had, we cannot borrow more money. And so my worry and the reason I've been asking the question several times is if it's 3.8, if it's three, we're gonna have to figure out something that I don't know what we're gonna do. Um, and that's what I'm looking for answers to. Sure, so um, there's a couple of things. So first off, the first 10 million, as you pointed out, was, was easy, we, simple ge general deduction. Um, the second 10 million has not um, I, I checked with Dennis yesterday. He still hadn't received it yet. Um, I've been doing behind the scenes, been getting, uh, had a meeting at, with you and Matthew. We talked about HVAC things and different stuff. But the rules have been moving around, been um, getting up updates from Dennis on the ARPA stuff. And just uh, Wednesday, the Ar ARPA stuff has different people following it and, and do things that are allowed. And, and they, they, they send that out because the final rule is is actually just has pieces stuck into it from people who have asked questions and different parts like that. So some of the different people that have asked questions that it's still been a moving target, but we haven't got the second 10 million yet. My understanding is that was to come this month and we already expended funds from it. Is yeah. that the correct? Correct. Yeah, okay. that shows up in the ARPA report here that we have expended funds plus we donated 10 million standard reduction, but we have not moved that 10 million over 
or two. Or right, but irrespective, the rules haven't changed from the Department of the Treasury as far as the four categories and what's allowable and what's not. Is that is that something that's it hasn't different? necessarily changed, but okay. it, it gets more defined as right. more people are sending stuff in. I'm I'm not saying it's the categories have stayed the same, but what we just received um, was a white paper on the use of ARPA funds for a new correctional center project by a CPA firm on the East Coast. And they walk through how they're using the ARPA funds, which is what we were hoping for was not, was to be able to give you some assurance, start seeing people that are doing a similar thing to what we're trying to do to make sure um, we pick the right categories to spend the money so that we won't cause grief or issues. And since we didn't need the money till the end of the project, we were trying to make sure we had done our research and our due diligence before we picked a project that wouldn't be accessible. <coughs> with this with this paper that I um, that Dennis provided for me on I think Tuesday or Monday on Monday, I'm sorry. They basically um, in Sarpy County of a eighty million dollar project they used thirteen million dollars. Yeah, I got copies here. They might actually copies um, of yes. Would you Yeah I'd like you, to see that you, too. Would you take this document, please? You want to I receive just, it, you mean? Yeah, yeah would yeah. you receive this document? So I need, I'll I need move to, to receive. Use. Second. Motion by Raddick, second by DeWitt. Any discussion? All those in favor of receiving, say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? <coughs> Passes 5-0. I would like to go to the back of it to exhibit A, please. So exhibit A, um, courtroom located for public viewing and inmate docking. Um, they put the construction costs, their design fee, total estimated cost of, and we have this, so that's almost, uh, almost $800,000, okay? Pre-booking, mental, medical, COVID assessment and spacing, again, that's about $600,000, and again, we have that space. Video visitation area, again, we have the video visitation area, so following their model, when you ask the questions, and they're even allowing money for uh, front lobby, and then audio visual for jail courtrooms and others. Again, we have audio visual for jail courtrooms and others. The difference on that one is our, our jail courtroom video stuff we need about $250,000 for it, okay? So it's a, it's a larger number, and we would have to change this number to fit Woodbury County. But looking at this, um, then, then they go on to the next thing they pick is FF&E, which is furniture, fixtures, and equipment. And they're saying that's allowable under COVID as well. And they, um, I went to Exhibit A just so you could see the, just so you could see the numbers. If you actually go back, in the front part of this, they actually define what section of the COVID dollars they're using to do this funds, why it's why it, why in their opinion it should be used, and why it's accessible. So to me, this was a this was a great document to have because, um, and speaking with Dennis, we'll talk a little bit about that. But sorry, medical wing, we don't have dental health services, so we have to cross that one off the list because we don't have that. Uh, cost for HVAC improvements, ours has actually been running just a little bit higher than that. That's That was the 1.8 that I've been trying to track, so our number could be greater than that, okay? Cost for outdoor, cost for outdoor recreation area. We do not have an outdoor recreation, but we have an indoor yeah, outdoor right. that meets the ACI standards because it has a roll-up garage door that you can open up that is the same as being outside. So bottom line, if you go through all these numbers, just taking their numbers, that's about $8.6 million. I know we needed 4.2, but that's about 8.6. So with this, you have a county that's gone through this and they've identified looking at the rules and I'm sure working with their attorney and getting approval from their county board on what their county board is comfortable they, with doing. They, they didn't use their attorney, they used their CP, a CPA firm that they hired. Okay, or whoever they yes, relied yes, upon. Yes. We rely upon our assistant county attorney. 
in the next couple of weeks, is it reasonable to think that this board will receive something similar so that our assistant county attorney can say, I agree, but this doesn't really fit the definition of what I would recommend because we've been having these conversations you should feel comfortable doing because as you know, once this money is expended for that purpose, if it's recouped, it, can, it cannot be used again. And so we wanna make sure we're on doubly sure ground. Is that something in the next two or three weeks? Otherwise, we're gonna to have to find whatever that gap is. We're past the budget time where I don't think we can increase taxes. We can't borrow anymore. And so that's where I'm, you know, and I think this board would wanna see what's our gap, if any. Maybe it's not, maybe there's 4.2 and I'm hoping that's the case, but right. is that a reasonable timeline? Yeah, we can we can turn this number in in a couple three weeks. Have this document set up for you. Okay. Um, is it question. is it still your opinion that the incremental improvements to HVAC is still the number one allowable expense you can identify? Um, it originally was until I read I read this thing and and some of their basis of what they're. Um, I'm not Joshua, uh, and, and I'm not I'm not even speaking for Joshua. I don't understand. I read their, their reasonings and their rules in this white paper. They, they make good arguments for a lot of other things in here. What I thought was unique about this is um, of their whole funding, they did not take the $10 million standard deduction and apply it to this. They actually left the $10 million standard deduction alone and are, and are doing this in different categories. So that, because they had 36 million, I think you told me, Dennis, right? Sar Sarpy County yeah, got 36, they got 36 million. million off the fund, yes. They left their $10 million standard deduction alone and are going based on the categories, billing for this 13. So where I was headed with that statement, again, not my choice, you guys are the ones that choose, but if Joshua says, hey, you identified 5.6 million. Uh, of, of the 8.6, I think I could bring to you, You've delivered, you've identified 5.6 million. I'm, I'm not saying you have to change, but you have, would have the ability then to change. Maybe you take some of the general deduction you've already given us and switch the funding to take, take this submittal for the 5.6, so that gives you 1.4 that has less strings attached to it. Of that, you see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So, so that's, that was the, the good news about this document that I was provided was I think it could give the board some other latitudes on some other things if, but it depends on if Joshua agrees with the white paper that we have and different ones of that. Okay? One caution in regards to the white paper. Um, a lot of this, and I've actually seen this before, I think they provided it to Dennis before, it's dated January 12th of this year, which is just a few days after the final rule came out. And I think at that point, um, people were still kind of trying to figure out what's in the final rule and, and what does it say. Um, if you look at this, they're relying on the interim final rule for most of their expenditures. Yes. Um, with the understanding that um, allocations that were made under the interim final rule can, you can go ahead with those um, up to a certain point. And I, so I think that's what Sarpy County is doing is they said, well, we think it fits under certain items of the interim rule and they are running with that, but it's not really an analysis of the final rule. I mean, it, it can be helpful um, because some of the things in the interim rule are the same unchanged in the final rule. Um, but one one big change in the final rule as compared to the interim rule is that any capital expenditure over a million dollars has to have a written justification and that's gotta be submitted to the treasury. So I think that's part of this discussion is, and, and maybe what's what Jeremy's getting at is who's doing the written justification and when is the board gonna see that? Um, because ultimately just determining whether to allocate the money, 
the board needs to have that information to determine if it meets that sure. criteria. But if, I mean, our building, our building is a little bit bigger, but <coughs> if you walk down through there, you, you picked a million dollars, and I'm not, please, I'm not pushing back, I'm just asking. Uh, if, we, if we allocate um, the money in similar proportions, the courtroom, the courtroom's gonna be under a million dollars. So uh, that piece of that would be under a million dollars. The pre-booking area, again, would be under a million dollars. The video visitation would be under a million dollars. The front lobby, so my question to you, where I was heading with that question, are you looking at it as a as a total? Or are they looking at it per line item? Because each of these line items build into a different, build into some different funds and some different funds. They gotta go by project. It's and by I'd project, like to yeah. Something there too, and I'm not putting Doc <clears throat> on the point here, or any criticize him at all. Sarbi County has a whole staff of attorneys. They have a whole staff of experts. They chose to go with a firm out of Virginia, has two offices in Iowa, and they went with an individual called Jack Reagan, who is an expert on ARPA. ARPA. He has gone through all this. He sees no problems whatsoever with it. Does the board feel comfortable? I think we ought to hire a firm like that and put Joshua off the hook here. I absolutely agree. Yes no. I, uh, and just because if they are bonded and insured and in what they do and they guarantee their work and there is something to fall back on, it's not our staff. It's something we can go after as a company that's made a mistake. It's a, there's an extra insurance policy if you hire somebody else to do it. Plus, you can use ARPA funds to hire those people. Absolutely, you absolutely can use ARPA funds to hire those people. We can use ARPA funds to pay for what we're paying, and the county now to assist us, and we can use ARPA funds for that also. But this is just a thought or a suggestion. Hey. That's what I wanted from the beginning on the all 20 million, though. So, I mean, you're preaching to the choir to me. But again, we decided the board. Thought, in case there's any skepticism on any of these projects, then it takes kind of Joshua off the hook here. But we rely upon legal counsel. Sure. Ultimately, we're responsible for the decisions. If we're looking for whose legal counsel did you get so we can sort of opinion shop, oh, that's the one in, in Virginia to affirm we are still responsible at the end of the day if it sure. gets challenged and say, well, you went and you shopped nationwide if, for somebody that was giving hired. that opinion as a fait accompli. I mean, I, I want to be as least restrictive as we can. That's my, my point of using this versus not property tax and give the authority who's done a great job of measuring twice so you can cut once. That's evident by the meetings. So I, I want there to be nothing but praise and compliment that, toward that direction. I just want to make sure that uh, we're on good ground. I, so, however that works to be able to to get that. I mean, if, and I, I I've previously said to you that I'm sure there's people out there that are a lot more knowledgeable than than me personally or anyone in our office. Just that if there's somebody that's dealing with it all the time, um, I, I I think that they're could be some wisdom in that. Um, and and I, all along the way, have tried to preach caution, and I, I think the board has, has done that. The, the rule, you know, when we had the interim rule and then different iterations of the guidance from the Treasury, it, it kind of seemed like things were evolving, and, and they're still, as Shane alluded to, we have the final rule, but they're still periodically releasing uh, frequently asked questions that um, provide some additional guidance. Um, so, you know, we're, we're still kind of learning. Um, at one point when we did look into getting an out, outside counsel during the period of the, the interim final rule, there wasn't anyone out there that was willing to give definitive answers, any, anything more than, than what we were saying. Um, I think at, at some point, now that we have the final rule, um, there probably are people like a CPA firm or, or whoever else the board may go to that would provide more uh, definitive answers. But as Keith said, um, when you use an outside entity, there's, there's insurance coverage if they, they make the wrong call. Now, 
that that's that provides a level of comfort. Um, again, I don't know if they're going to be able to say definitively this is a yes or no on certain things, but they can hopefully point in the right direction. I just think then our exposure is zero. And where I was headed and what I was going to say, if you want the comfort, you can always take whatever they give you and ask Joshua to give you an opinion on whatever they say as well. I'm, I'm fine with, and, and, you know, I'm one, one person up here, but I'm fine with that. I just want to make sure that we have, you know, whether it's Joshua or somebody else from the outside signing off, I want you all to, you know, have the authority that you need without getting to the end and finding out uh, this really didn't qualify. And he says, you know, let's know right now because that's it. Again, from the get-go, I, I would be a lot more comfortable using somebody that is an outside firm that has the liability uh, and, you know, is well bonded in order to right. to give us that opinion. Just because uh, it's a fallback. It's an insurance policy for us. And we still have a, another budget cycle we're going to go through before we start paying all the bills on this. So we do have that coming up too. If there's a worst case scenario here, but uh. everybody remember, these funds don't have to be allocated until December 31st of 2024, and do not have to be spent until 26. The same time frame in 26. I'm not saying that's an issue, but that's why we've always looked toward spending them at the end of the project rather than up front. I will say Sarpy County took a different approach. They, they started, they, in this document you also see, they already started spending the money as well. I think the first payment, because this document to Joshua's point was dated in January, their first payment went out in January as well. It's the... Uh, paid four million out, I believe. Yeah, four, four point. Um, it's on page six and it shows uh, they paid 4.815634 already out of this already. Um, right now, we had done the approach that we were spending the money last because with the money and with the calculations of the schedule of values, we did not need to spend even of that $10 million until November of this year. Based on progress on the site and the speed of it, we felt it was November or December before we would have to pay out any money at all out of the ARPA funds. And to the point Jeremy brought up, there is no intent in my mind or any of the board members, I believe, or these people here, there will not be any more tax dollars such as a bond issue. That's no, that, that isn't going to happen. If there's a shortfall and there won't be now because we're fully funded with this, you know, document and the one Kenny had, the money is all there. Now, we may not spend it all. That's a good probability there. We may not spend 60. I may be 68. Or 67 depends if we want to do furniture and fixtures. The 1.6 million for contingencies could only be half a million. There's a million left over there, but there won't be any more tax dollars per se as a bond issue. That that isn't going to happen. Okay. So two things. Yes. One in response to it doesn't need to be spent until then. And from a tax budgetary side, we need to know if there's a, a yep. shortfall, right? Yep. Um, so with that, I do think it would be helpful in the next two or three weeks. And then whether the board uses outside counsel or whatever, I just think that'd be helpful to be able to have the assurance to answer. The second thing I want to allude to is what Dennis just said. And I, I want to make sure this is cleared up. Right now, there's $1.6 million in change order contingency. That is correct. And 125,000, uh, roughly, 1.613. Yes, yes. Roughly 125,000. Right, yes. Okay. But what you said on the furniture fixture and equipment has changed. Yes. A week and a half ago, there was 1,076,000 that was unallocated. That is correct. And today it's FF&E 964,377. So that unallocated 
this does now include furniture, fixture, and equipment. Yes, and, and but you, and the board. Change, go ahead. Sorry. To change that, it take an amendment to the lease, saying, does Woodbury County want to run up through our CIP furniture equipment, or do you want to leave it in with the authority and pay it out of there, and then we don't do a CIP project and borrow the money? Well, I would prefer to see, again, if we can, if you can get in contact with the CPA firm and have it in a couple of weeks on our agenda, have them actually identify the projects and give it a few months to go through and identify, you know, as much potential ARVA funding that could be used. Um, because then we know if we need to come back in with reserves or anything else before January, you know, we need to know before the end of the year. Um, the way it's set up right now, you don't have to use reserves. I, I know, I know. 4.2 is, is yeah. validated. But, at, and, and to go back, I mean, to anybody paying attention or listening, March of 2021 is when we said, as a board, okay, the bids came in, what, much higher than expected. We're going to pledge and promise up to $15 million total to cover the costs, to cover alternatives, to cover any potential shortfalls, right? Yes. And that's what we did. And, you know, part of that we gave up front, which is that 800,000 almost contribution part, and that's why we're at 14.2 remaining, right? And that's, that's the background of how we get here. The jail hasn't gotten more expensive. We haven't gone out and borrowed more money. So anyone that believes that, that's not correct, you know. And, um, I guess for you know citizens and people paying attention, you know Ron and I have met as chairman, you know board of supervisors and chairman of the authority, and we're looking to you know keep our our project rolling along, you know at budget or under budget if possible. We're going to try to do the best we can in probably the craziest time to ever build a jail as far as building expenses and availability of contractors and availability of materials. Can you name a more challenging time? You can't. And, you know, I think we're doing the best we can as a board of supervisors and a joint authority to work together, get this project done. <clears throat> I'd like the assurance of the outside CPA firm. Uh, and if we can get that on the agenda to move forward, I'd love that. Of course, I can't speak for everybody, but I'd like a vote on it at some point. And I guess that's the, the end of me. What would you have there? And I, you know, the board of supervisors and authority should be commended for what they do. I'm going to give you two examples. There are actual examples. Down Sarver County, they're building a jail, 380 beds. Their cost, 80 million. Webster County is looking at a new jail to 136, I believe, people, or maybe 126, 50 million. Do you look at ours? 507, it's 69 million. I think the board and authority is doing a tremendous job of keeping the cost down, and we did it at the right time. Well, and if you rebid it now, you'd probably be pushing $70 million just for the cost instead of 59 And not to reiterate everything from the beginning, but we're going to have a, a new facility. It should last at least 50 years. We're going to have a new facility that's safer for officers to sally port in people that need to be locked up. And... We're going to have more offices for the attorneys. We're going to be able to partner better with the city's attorney's offices. And it's just going to be a better thing for our community moving forward to take people that need to have some time to rehabilitate and put them in a safe facility for it. So, just one more uh, thing, Keith. Yes. That on January 18th, Matthew did come back to the board, and they did reduce that 5.576 down to 14.2 officially. Yeah. From ARPA or other general basic reserves. So you got options there, but right now it's 4.2 on our ARPA report here, what we got left to spend. Yeah. And just to add some context to that, that extra 4.2 coming from the county sources that don't involve property tax, wherever that ultimately comes from, is now down to approximately 2.9 because of the board's recent action to allocate about 1.3 million to the Siouxland District Health employees under the um, allowances of the final rule. So we have about 2.9 million uh, to find allocations for, which is about 
what we have unobligated at this time. So again, I think our two takeaways from today is we need to update the lease and we need to get some sort of summary like this. I'd like it back from, from you know, the project manager, at least as a starting point. And then if we have a CPA firm review it or the county attorney's office review it, at least we can identify the one or two best, you know, best bang for your buck options that we can deal with. And to me, that was the HVAC and, you know, potentially something else that you've identified. But if we're looking at another 1.8 million for that, then we're down to almost a million. Right. And then we have, as a worst case scenario, we have the fallback of the sale of the county farm. And that's non-tax as well. So. So I would like to ask one more question before you, you go on. Uh, Kevin and I will be back in two weeks. Um, if somebody does an agenda item, I, w I will gladly um, get this put together. That means we have to have it done and to this lovely person by at least noon on Thursday before the, before the meeting yep. so that she can have them in everybody's packets, okay? But if that is acceptable to everybody, we'll, we'll put a target on to come back before you in two weeks with that document to talk about this information. Is that... I think that's what Sounds you guys were asking mm -hmm. for. I think that should fall within mm -hmm. an acceptable time frame and both of us will be back at that time. And do you want to, who can, would that be you that looks into who is going to review our expenditures? Yeah. Yes. All right. And Sarvey County did look at several firms that they picked this one because they have the most expertise in this project, our project. So that's probably one that we'll come back with. I'm going to talk to my friend down there, the finance director in Sarby County, and also we call the firm up, and if Keith wants to come in, he'll have a conference call, and then we come back to the full board. Seems like it could be the same night, potentially, even, that you all come back. and Sure. Mm -hmm. Anything else I'll get out of here? <clears throat> and again, I didn't mean that as any insult to... Your abilities, it's just right. the... And, and none, none is taken. I, mean, <laughs> I, I suggested along the way that it would be beneficial to have someone else look at it. Um, just as I'm sitting here, I, I think the board should um, see what's available as far as attorneys that would give advice on this as well because it, to me it seems more of a legal question than a tax question, and I'm surprised that a, a CPA is willing to put their license on the line for it. Um, so that would be my advice in that regard, but um, I'm sure that Dennis can do the due diligence on that. Yeah, and what I'd ask this firm, if this is the firm I go with, how many other counties, cities have they been advising also? Is it just Sarby, or is this, do they do 100 of them or 200 of them? And I assume, Joshua, as with any contract, that you would review that contract potentially with uh, an outside legal counsel and read the fine print that says, you know, this guarantees or this will be underwritten or, or just its friendly suggestion and good luck on your own. Yeah, I can be a part of that process. Thank you. The insurance policy. I think it's helpful to note, too, that the text of the final rule does note that it's not Treasury's ob objective to recoup funds immediately, but to work with the county to find eligible uses, um, which in a project of this scale and across the budget of our size, we would be dealing with you know, several different options for available uses. So that's why if it's not worth the parsing within the jail project to find it all there, we still have options that we've identified elsewhere. The option with Sioux and District Health will be there next year to a lesser degree. We wouldn't get a 1.3, but we may get a couple hundred, few hundred thousand out of that as well. So um, we're not necessarily in opposition to Treasury at any point. They're, they're always in a position where they're working with us. And I think that's kind of lost on some of the discussion is, you know, in the public is that we are working with Treasury and they will work with us. And that's part of the reason why we've been so reserved and conservative and as the interim final rule came out, as the final rule came out, as you're hearing, we're not spending these funds as soon as we possibly can because we are providing these reports. If there's a problem identified, 
we're, we're being totally transparent on where it's allocated a couple years out e even or, and where it's been actually spent. And if there's any feedback we receive, we incorporate that. And so far, we've been submitting these on time and we've been, and they've been accepted by the Treasury. Is that correct? Correct. Yes. Thank you. Well, I'd like to thank the board. Uh, we kind of got off into the weeds, but uh, it seems like with every portion of this project, it doesn't matter what or, whether it's budgeting, ARPA funds, or uh, paving roads, or what it might be, we get off into the weeds. Uh, and it takes a lot of time. I'd like to thank Ron Wick. Uh, he's the chairman of the authority. He's here. Ron, if you'd just like to come up and, and speak a few words. Uh, Ron has uh, spent a tremendous amount of time uh, working on this project for us, and, and it's really appreciated. Um, he, his help has been a real value, and his time has been a real value for us. So, really appreciate it. Thank you, Kenny. And one of the things that Keith and I did when we were working the referendum was promise the people of Woodbury County that we were going to be here, and we were going to make sure that the best project that we could put on the ground would be put on the ground, and it would be done as cost effective as we possibly could do. And I got to tell you that that's what's happening. I, I've, I've got a great group of people to work with, and we're, we're, we're moving forward as quickly as we can, and we're going to deliver what we told the people of Woodbury County that we would. Thank you. Thanks, Ron. Any other discussion on the item? Come on up, Tony Winger. I just wanted on record on the, here that watching these guys work in our office right now as we speak over there, there there's two garbage buckets collecting. Hopefully it's rainwater. I don't think it is um, from from the pipes. Um, and <laughs> <laughs> I want I want to thank Ron. I want to thank Kenny. I want I want to thank Kevin. I want to thank Shane. I don't know anything about building it. Constru the construction of this big, you want me to build a house or a room? Yes, I can, I can work on that. But listening to them and watching them hold contractors' feet to the fire, making sure that everything is approved so this building will last 50 years, is I just sit back and I giggle because I'm thinking this, this would be a fist fight in a different world, but they just keep going after people. And I, I'm very confident with those, everybody here that I'm very happy to watch them product they're going to deliver us so I just I just wanted that on the record everybody's talking about it tonight thank you anybody else out there? all right moving on item 15 Board of Supervisors Matthew Young Jeremy Taylor approved the request for proposals regarding selection of law firm for collective bargaining and union negotiations setting a close closing submission date of 4 p.m. on June 27th of 2022 who wants it looks like it's Matthew <coughs> all right <laughs> well, this is a follow-on from our item uh, from several weeks ago when the board approved um, the county attorney's office drafting a, an RFP for uh, legal services for collective bargaining purposes. Um, this is just, again, a periodic thing that when you go through several years or perhaps several decades without considering what options are out there, what law firms are qualified, that may have come, come onto the scene or that uh, perhaps we want to, you know, get a better, uh, you know, just get a better idea of what we're currently being offered if we, if we retain the same law firm. Um, this is being presented for approval to start this process and the closing submission date is simply a, a starting suggestion. I don't know what the board's, uh, Timeline is, but if we're looking at approximately five weeks, that's what's recommended. Uh, plenty of time for law firms to get their RFP, get the RFP filled out, and then again, at that point, could be referred to a working group, um, as mentioned in the agenda item, um, after interviews and and things like that. 
Ditto. I concur. No, okay. I, All right. I think that was well said. <laughs> All right. Uh, is there any thought on the timing for the submission date from anybody? Is that okay? That's a Monday. We would at least know what we've received by the board meeting the next day. I think it's a good amount of time for potential firms to be either notified or to respond, yeah. um, but not so much time that it becomes a, a drag and doesn't move us off a dead center. All right, uh, and again, this will be limited to the purpose of collective bargaining and union negotiations. So I'll move to approve the RFP regarding the selection of a law firm for collective bargaining and union negotiations and setting a closing submission date of 4 p.m. on June 27th, 2022. Second. We have a motion by Ong and a second by Taylor. Any other discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? All right, that passes 5-0. Moving on, item 16, reports on committee meetings. Uh, Rocky, any? Uh, no, I went to a ship meeting and there was quite a bit of discussion. It's grant writing season, but uh, nothing really newsworthy. They're trying to put together some liaison type grants for public school resource officers, I think they're called, that sound right, and a diversion program type thing was just one of the things they were talking about, but past that, nothing terribly serious. Jeremy. Matthew. I had uh, workforce development uh, with our region uh, making some changes uh, with the staff that assists. Um, she's found a new job. That was Kim Wilson that was with um, Action Community, Agency. Yes, Community Action Agency. Uh, so they're putting applications out for somebody to fill that position and the board will likely work with them again, I'd assume, to have them fill that role. Um, Kim did that as a part-time employee, but the job is really full-time, so they're gonna have to allocate more funds from the workforce development to have that staff help. Uh, also had SEDC uh, prove some uh, work and we had my um, I had my wellness thing here and I'm still obese. Uh, so, uh, chips. Yeah, they had those chips, 320 calories, one bag. Citizen concern. Right? Um, actually, I think we could provide a little public update on our hiring process uh, for the EMS director. That posting is closed. Is that correct? It is closed. So it is closed. At this point, we've interviewed five of the eight finalists, and by the end of the week, we will have completed that process. So just to update everyone that that's ongoing. Citizen concern round two. <laughs> okay. Oh, maybe it's not. Hey, I, um, since we were, I focused so much on the, on the LEC project, I forgot to give you one other up, quick update on the 2018 stuff. I want to send out a special thank you to Mark Nara. So there was a gap on our project. Uh, the county, county engineers helped with the road out there, keeping access to the LEC site, has done a phenomenal job of helping, helping get, keep um, the LEC project open and that he keep the LEC project moving. Um, so I just wanted to say a special thank you to Mark, to your engineer department. I would say, uh, you know, I took a couple drives out there at different times in spring, and both times I was able to get out there in a two-wheel drive truck, so good work. Yes, go ahead. Okay. Uh, <coughs> Maria Rankois, 2021 Norman Drive. So um, I have read 406 pages of the ARPA rules, and I have the final rule Then I will give it to you just as a brief of the funds. The, so, and I would recommend that whatever other counties do, whether in the East Coast or Sarpy County, uh, we are unique county and we would like you as a public elected official do the right decisions. 
and because we are going to be audited. Again, um, and my last thing, thank you for your leadership, and I'm concerned uh, about an elected official bashing me on Facebook. And I will I'll ask respect from an elderly citizen myself. And this public official is Mr. Ang. So I will ask respect. Thank you, you all. Thank you. Sheriff, did you have something to bring up there? Yeah, I, uh, I just wanted to uh, say that last week was Law Enforcement Memorial Week, and uh, we honored uh, the fallen uh, people from Woodbury County last week. And uh, at the same time, we handed out our annual awards and just wanted to make the board aware. I don't know uh, if it was covered uh, in, in media sources. I've, I've kind of gotten off of all social media over the last several months. I would highly recommend that for anybody who hasn't done that for at least a period of time. Um, but the, uh, the Phil Heimbecker Award is awarded to uh, Deputy of the Year, and that award was given to Eric Fay. He was also awarded a Purple Heart and a uh, Medal of Valor. Uh, the John Herman uh, Award is awarded to the Correctional Officer of the Year, and that was awarded to Shane Severide. The John Winkle Volunteer Award uh, was given to Reserve Deputy Josh Hollowell. The Civilian Employee Award was given to Tammy Blackburn, uh, who handles the Sex Offender Registry for us, which I, 380 or something like that, I think is approximately the number on the registry in Woodbury County. Um, and there's been some restruct restructuring a little bit through the state DCI. The agent who used to be assigned here did a lot more work than what was really required of, a, of the DCI to do it, and uh, he has been uh, moved and, and gone elsewhere, and it's required Tammy to, to do a lot more work, and she's just done an outstanding job. And then the Community Policing Award was given to uh, Deputy Sage Lewis, who has been heavily involved in a boxing program, Red's Gym, uh, in South Sioux, and, and works with a lot of underprivileged and at-risk at kids. Uh, and donates a lot of his time and some of the money out of his own pocket to work with some of these kids and their families and uh, talking to Sage over the last year and getting to know him better. Uh, he, he gets calls in the evenings and uh, outside of his working hours that families who trust him because of those relationships that he's built and uh, most recently within the last month or two, uh, a runaway was recovered in South Sioux uh, because the family had reached out to Sage, Sage reached out to a connection with South Sioux PD, and, and the and the juvenile uh, was was recovered safely. And and so those are some of the awards. Um, you know, it's it's I feel almost unfair to single any one person out because the people who are working over there continue to work under pretty extreme conditions, both in the jail and out on the road, and and they do a great job every day. But just thought I'd I'd let you be aware of of those that we've uh, at least given those awards too, so thank you. Thank you. I won't take much time. Uh, speaking on behalf of Mike Simone for CWA, he got detained, um, so he asked me to speak. Uh, we're just respectfully requesting that the wage portion of contracts for correctional officers be open when the deputies begin to negotiate. Um, you should, I guess, received a letter. I don't know if it was today or sometime earlier this week. Just wanted it spoken into record. Thank you. Thank you. Come on up. <laughs> I just want to address this, uh, the correctional officer side. So talking about the, the new facility and we've, we've uh, through, the, through the budget process, we talked about the additional staff um, I, I learned uh, some numbers from Dennis yesterday. Uh, and Chuck, who was just here, we were talking. So our starting, uh, the starting hourly wage for a correctional officer for the county is $21 an hour currently. Chuck, in a meeting this morning, said that uh, your 17-year-old son was offered a job at Target for $22 an hour to start. 
Um, Sarpy County just increased their uh, starting wage for their correctional officers from $22 an hour to $27 an hour, which my guess is is directly related to the state of Nebraska, who back, I think, in November took their starting wage from, I believe, $21 an hour or $20 an hour to $28 an hour. De uh, Dennis told me, I didn't know this, that Sarpy's going to be hiring 36 new correctional officers to staff the facility that they're building. I know that it might be out of character, out of normal, uh, to open the wage portion of a contract a year early. The time, to me, it makes sense, and I say this just from a, from a standpoint of trying to recruit staff to work in the new facility that if it wouldn't take effect until July of 2024, if I'm not mistaken, the contract is talking about opening it up early. But that would be something that we could utilize, whatever that wage increase would be, as we start recruiting heavily in the next six months to a year to start hiring in January. At least if we say, you know, you're going to work at this rate because the contract's already signed, but as of July 1, it's going to go to this. I think that will make it a lot easier for us to try and recruit. It's going to make it easier for us to compete with these competitive uh, jobs that are out there in the same field. Uh, the other thing is retention. And I know we talked about this during the budget process, but in the last two weeks, three weeks, we've had six correctional officers leave the organization to take higher paying jobs either in the public or private sector. Um, it's, it's just becoming more and more difficult. And, I, and look, I know you have a tough job and I know there's only so much money out there, but I would just ask if you, if you can at least reconsider opening the contract one year early for the correctional officers, for the staffing, especially looking at the new facility it's going to be vitally important to recruit because one thing that wasn't talked about as we've talked about tonight but was talked about during the budget process. To me, the worst case scenario is that we don't have the staff to have the federal inmates that we want to offset the $4 million bond uh, cost. And to me, that's, that's a worst case scenario that we're, we're still working very hard to, to work with the marshals and with, uh, with ICE and, and other uh, organizations, but I think it'll make it easier. So I just, I just plead that case to, to do what we can. Okay. Go ahead. Can I ask something in response yeah, here? Absolutely. So would you be open to you, and this is just informational to the board, yep. yeah, number of correctional officers and kind of where Dakota and Union and Sarpy some of the information that you've well, stated, um, that's and, then, job. <laughs> and then annual expenditures. I mean, I, I just want a kind of a data-driven picture, if we can. Sure. You want yeah, comparable? I'll, I can certainly give Yeah, you essentially, and, uh, you know, within a, thing. well, and, and not just certain ones, within a, you know, a 10 to 12 county mile yeah. radius. And so, as, as we discussed earlier, and, and we'll, Melissa was in on some of the conversation, you know, if, from looking at a, a, a young person who might want to get into this field, if you've just graduated from WIT or Iowa Western down in Council Bluffs or Morningside College, and we're trying to lure them to come and work for Woodbury County. If they can go and work in SARPY and make six or seven dollars an hour more and, and all the amenities that a, that, a million do, that a million population area offers, it makes it really hard to keep them here or to have them come here over those other places. And so, but we'll definitely put the numbers together. Uh, I haven't talked to anybody from Dakota County. I would assume they're going, they're, they've got to be looking at the same things we're looking at. And if, they're, if their facility ends up going through and they're hiring 15 more people, they're going to be competing with the same competitors that we're, we're competing with. And it's just, I mean, it's, I, I am uh, very cautiously optimistic that we'll be even able to hire half of the people we want to hire, to be honest, in the, in the current environment. Like, you know, 
and hopefully something can be done and you can help us and, and make it easier for us to try and recruit and, and retain. I mean, that's the six that we've lost. The turnover time is, what do we figure we're down? I think about two or three months we'll be down those six spots. And that's, that's tough. I mean, it's tough for the staff. I mean, you know that, so that's all. But we'll get those numbers. Thank you. Anyone else in citizen concern? Board concern round two, or round one, I guess. Yeah, I'm gonna <clears throat> briefly wade into the mud regarding Maria's little jab at me. I believe what she's referencing stems from a public post she made after the leaked Roe v. Wade preliminary decision, where she said publicly as a public candidate that five men were in danger of taking away women's rights. I simply highlighted publicly as a public official that Amy Coney Barrett is a woman. Now she may not believe that she's a woman, but she is. So, and I would say if you can't, you know, she's not gonna make it very far in politics if every time you feel slighted by a comment on your public comments as a candidate, you run to the board meeting citizen concerns. That's, there's only a couple people in this community that do that. And I think and that's pretty, speaks volumes. I'm done. Anybody else? What do you got? Tomorrow night, we're having a landfill meeting. There's gonna be an important issue discussed because Gill, which has been sold to a company out in California, they are terminating the contract December 31st and wanna renegotiate. What I don't like about it, they're doing the middle of fiscal year when we got the money already levied for the cost that they had said they'd do till July 1st next year. But they have the, they serve the notes ahead of time, so we know, so tomorrow night there'll be a pretty good discussion because if they raise it, what do we do? They have money on hand probably to do it, but we can't go back and raise taxes, you know, to make up the cost. So tomorrow night, it's after the E911 meeting. I hope our representatives from the board come. Like I say, it's gonna be a rather informative meeting and something that's kind of important. If we have a landfill or don't have a landfill, because I don't know who would take over if Gail didn't have it. I don't know who could handle it to begin with, but that'll be seen tomorrow night. All right. See no other concerns, we're adjourned. What comparables are you referring to?